Good morning, everyone. Well, it's morning for us. <laughs> Come on in. Um, this is Girls with Sabres. I'm Imris, and I am joined with my partner in uh, Girls with Sabres, Luthien. Say hi, friend. Hi, friend. <laughs> And we're also joined with a very special guest. We have Michelle from the Unknown Regions podcast. Yay! Yeah, hello. Good morning, everyone. Let's try this again. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there's just so much to I talk about that. in this novel. We just we just had to share the, the good Raylo tea and, and discuss it. So... Yep. There is a lot to discuss, so I say let's just jump right into this novelization and just enjoy the Raylo tea. Now, I will say that we're not going to give a full review of the book. In this live stream, we are only concentrating on the Raylo and the Bendemption part of the book. <laughs> so, um, basically, that's how all we want to talk about. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> So, um, so let's it's really our bread and butter. So, yeah, yeah. So let's start right at their first force bond in the, the movie and in the book. And it says explicitly that um, their first force bond since Crate, which is on Pisana. Yep. Just want to quickly say again, hello to everyone. I see the chat filling up. And we got some mods in here. We got Sally Beth. We got 2Med2 two two Star Wars Network in the house. So thank you so much. Um, a lot of you I see um, are, are jumping in here. And you were all, a lot of you were a, a part of the live stream we, we uh, did on Wednesday. So thanks so much for joining us right now. Yeah. Don't, yeah, don't forget to smash the like button. That helps, especially in these times these dark times yes yeah. yeah so yes we are with michelle from unknown regions podcast and uh she's got a lot of great insight into the novel and yeah we're gonna get right into it like emma said so in Pasana is uh there basically ray says this wasn't a vision it was a force connection their first since crate and with the connection came a certain that turned the blood in her veins to eyes. He'd been looking for her. <laughs> um, we go right into right into a banter, just like we do um, with with Darcy and Elizabeth and Pride and Prejudice and Jane Eyre with Rochester and Jane. So, Luthien, friend, would you mind uh, reading that encounter for us? I got this. I offered you my hand once, he said in that maddeningly calm voice. You wanted to take it. She didn't deny it. <laughs> Why didn't you? He asked. You could have killed me, she said. Why didn't you? You can't hide, Ray. Not from me. It did something strange to her, to hear her name on his lips. Had he ever spoken it aloud before? She couldn't remember. Yes, she could. Well, it might as well be Claire <laughs> and Jamie Frazier speaking to each other right now. Oh, you're with right. Jargon. <laughs> yeah. Ray Carson uh, is brilliant, brilliantly descriptive right now. Like, romance level, as she should be. I mean, to just use uh, literally just the use of the word lips, like, mm hmm. I see what you're laying down there, our yeah. car. <laughs> well, and if we don't have feelings for somebody, just them saying their our name wouldn't do anything to us, you know. <laughs> like, um, you know, the the fact that her him just saying her name held so much power over her um, really does show her true her true feelings for him. That was probably the first line in the book where I, it it hit me like Ray Carson has our back yeah, I think yeah. as much as she possibly can is that and sometimes you know there were 
I was discussing with a couple of people like that they thought that the book was not very romantic at all. And I was like, um, Paige, whatever that is, whatever that name on her, his lips line, like that's not, that is coding. Like, how are you missing this? It's so romantic. It is. It is. And re- remember from uh, The Last Jedi when she said his true name, Ben, the look he gives her. Oh I my mean, gosh. Sad, but in, in book form of where he says her name and she, you know, internally starts at that where it's just like hello Mm -hmm. yeah amy showers with a super chat thank you so much you luthien should have done the audiobook because wow much better than the person they had reading the book oh stop it amy (laughs) thank you emrys has done audiobooks i sure have believe it or not um so i read an audio book like um professionally recorded. yes professionally i had uh a publisher cool. yeah i had a publisher come and i read a couple of ones and you can still find them it's not under emerus so good luck finding it audiobooks ever written and now that i'm quarantined oops sorry uh, find, uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't say the Q word. All right. Uh, Q, Q, Q. Moving forward, moving on. Yes. Continue your lovely reading friend. <laughs> yes. So Amy, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, so I see through the cracks in your mask. She said, you're haunted. You can't stop seeing what you did to your father. She imagined that moment as clearly as she could. Han's hand on Kylo's cheek, gazing at his son with love, even as his dying body slumped over the chaotic red lightsaber that had skewered him. (laughs) Here we go, some more verbiage. Ray wrapped her mind around the image, threw it at Kylo. He flinched. Then he threw an image right back at her tally marks scratched into the wall of her down sand filled atat do you still count the days since your parents left such pain in you such anger he began walking toward her she steeled herself my mother doesn't see the darkness in you he went on relentlessly your friends don't either but i do and that was kylo's mistake because he was deeply wrong about all of it but I do. But I, but I do. do. But I do number one. But I do number. Oh but yeah, I number know. one. I think this reinforce and reinforces that they can see into each other's minds still. You know the fact that they're being able to throw uh, images and visions like basketballs into each other's minds is uh, really beautiful about their force connection connection even though this is really painful painful for them but there is one encounter that they have right towards the end of this force connection that is such a solo interaction um she opened her mouth to tell him to go kiss a rantar but he moved too fast into her space so that he loomed over her and smelled of molten iron to me, that go kiss a Renthar just is so much like how Leia said, I'd rather kiss a Wookiee. <laughs> then Han chases yeah. her down and just kind of, you know, gets into Leia's space. That that encounter right there screams uh, Han and uh, Leia solo right there to me. Oh, it yeah. totally it does. Verbal back and forth. And that's like... Uh, that's like they hit she's hitting me where I live because I'm old I'm not sure I'm I'm kind of old and um excuse me and so I think I was I would have been an eight or nine when Empire Strikes Back came out and I, I I didn't you know it's 1980 I don't know what shipping is I have no idea I'm eight what do I know and um but that there that kiss and their relationship and everything about Han and Leia I mean 
I I bought I got my mom I'm sure to take me to Kmart or whatever to buy the novelization of Empire Strikes Back, which I still have in this house somewhere. I don't know where it is, but ladies, I was annotating that book at age eight. Like I specifically remember sitting there with a pencil, underlining all the Han and Leia banter, and just being like, oh, oh, they're so darn cute. So this banter back and forth with Raylo is just. It's gold. It's gold to me. I love it. Uh, the 2Med2 two two Star Wars Network says, I love you ladies, but we interpret these words a bit differently, which is perfectly fine. Everything is left up to um, different interpretation. For uh, the female gaze, this dialogue is dialogue that so many, so many of us have read in female driven novels in Pride and Prejudice. Um, All of Jane Austen's novels has dialogue like this. Um, The Bronte Sisters has dialogue like this. So this is dialogue that is very um, familiar. And it's female gaze familiar. You don't get dialogue like this a whole lot. There is some... uh, but not a lot in a male gaze driven book. Male gaze driven so. books are just very literal in the way that Han Solo pursued Leia. Like, you know, you want to be kissed. You need to be kissed more often. Just kind of like a very um, Butler uh, gone with the wind type of discussion where, especially in uh, romance that is restraint And this is like a Pride and Prejudice, British, uh, Victorian British type of romance where it's really restraint. Ray and Ben are not going to say, you know, I want to kiss you. It's all about restraint and all about, you know, the tension um, between the two. Because in in romance of restraint, you don't just lay out your feelings. Um you want that kiss to be more so it goes to a boiling point until it spills out and over Mm -hmm. i would love to ask ray carson about that too if i ever get another chance to meet her i i really want to ask her like what you know what was your intent was that your intent to make this you know reminiscent of jane austen and and um, Jane Eyre and that kind of thing because you're right it's totally the back and forth bantery stuff is very um, I, I keep using the word coded but it it, it is mm-hmm. it's 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 coded so that it gets our attention having been exposed to that type of literature and loving it so yeah if I I'm I, I hope I don't know what's going to happen this summer with conventions and stuff but hopefully someday we'll get to run into her again yeah, it's, Sally Beth said, as cringe as ben's dialogue is at times in this book and i agree with her yeah. remember how disrespectful and belittling darcy was in pride and prejudice yep absolutely oh. absolutely mm-hmm. so moving on to the later connection in Pisana, which is the standoff um I I don't feel like we need to go into much detail. Personally, I don't feel like it. But ladies, if you feel there's something that you really want to highlight here, my favorite section in this is uh, Kylo realizes that Ray is his light. That and he he like literally that it literally says that Ray is his light. And, of course, he goes into the dark side thinking of, okay, well, if Ray is his light, he needs to eliminate her. But he cannot completely go there. He restrains. He delays his hand. And then once uh, she crashes his, sl- his, his ship, he has that thing uh, of, like, a gut reaction of, oh, I'm so glad. I'm scared that I almost... I almost pushed her to the fact where she could get hurt and he was relieved that he didn't. Now, this is a dark sided dude who's having that type of reaction, who has who's having that conscience, who is um, 
really turning. I mean, again, she's just the call to the light again. Mm-hmm. I really liked her description of the standoff in that he has those thoughts about her, you know, thinking that, oh, you know, she is my light and maybe Palpatine's right. No, 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 no. I don't want her to get hurt. And then the flip side of that actually made me laugh a lot was in, uh, I think, let's see. I'm looking at my book. It's the line where, oh, here, here it is. Ray turned off her lightsaber. She hoped he was dead. No, she didn't. <laughs> she hoped. She didn't know what she hoped. It's just, I don't know. It made me laugh. Just like, you guys, God, knock it off. Like, you obviously don't want to kill each other. Just come on. But again, it's that restraint, that back and forth where, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to get, they're not going to give us what we want right away. No. We have to stand See, there and turn fight first. Well, right. it feels, and we've, we've stated this before, that it's the Force Awakens rolling into the Rise of Skywalker with the only nod to The Last Jedi is when she says, I wanted to take your hand, Ben's hand. And when you disregard The Last Jedi, their banter in The Rise of Skywalker and in this novel makes sense. Where they're at with their personal conflict and the conflict between their each other makes sense. Um... And just like they physically dueled in the forest on Starkiller base, now they're physically dueling and they're verbally sparring. Verbally sparring as as much, it's like toe-to-toe with the physical duel. Um, yeah, it, it, and I think that's why for a lot of, of people, um, their, the interpretations are so... And again, this isn't right or wrong. Interpretations are so across the board. It's because... You know, either either you, you love The Last Jedi and you're rolling right into this novel loving The Last Jedi, or you kind of disregarded their whatever they had with each other in the last Jedi and you're just rolling right on from the force awakens. Um, it's all about perspective. Well, and you have other, you have other things in context that this is a romance. You have what Ryan Johnson said about the finger touching scene. Um, and of course we won't repeat it in the podcast, but go, (laughs) Go and remind yourself what uh, what Ryan Johnson said metaphorically was the nature. yes of a very intimate nature. So you have that you have um, a- a- again, we just said a lot of people watching the this relationship are just not familiar with the language of a, ro- a romance that is restraint. You know, they're. Uh, so I just I would suggest like this is the female gaze so if this language is unfamiliar to you just go and start reading Pride and Prejudice and Jane Eyre and all those novels that is um, inspiring the sequel trilogy because really it's been Pride and Prejudice in space and Jane Eyre in space since the very beginning I mean that's how Raylo's saw it because we saw this literature that we love being infused with Star Wars and I, I'm sure Ray Carson is a Janie <laughs> because of the way that he's he's she's writing this I mean if you read Pride and Prejudice Elizabeth and Darcy had banter through almost like three fourths even like a uh, seven eighths of the novel like if you read it you'd be like they are interested in each other but they yes they are it's just the way that this romance um, boils because neither one of them want to admit it because they're on two sides of the situation. They don't want to admit it because if they did, it would be too hard. But you see in a, a couple of other forced connections, 
there, <laughs> Ray Carson makes it even more <laughs> in your face that this is a romance, especially in the hangar bay. And the hangar bay is where she laid the glove down. <laughs> um, uh so let's go to the second uh, forced connection, which uh, is uh, speaking of intimate, is in his chambers. <laughs> Luthien, I hand it over to you to read uh, that little excerpt that we have. They were together and they were separate in each other's minds and spaces. But Ray didn't care. She just wanted to land a blow to hurt him. Their blades sizzled with impact as they fought, creeping closer to Vader's mask. It was Palpatine who had your parents taken, he said, like a patient teacher, as though they weren't in the fight of their lives. He was looking for you, but they wouldn't say where you were. And again, it's the the verbal back and forth, the verbal sparring. Um which Ray is doing so well where they're, they're walking around each other, just like Ray, you know, stalked past Kylo, like a, a matador to a bull during the duel on star Kylo base. Well, now they're, they're circling around each other and it's verbal. It's very much like the dance scene in pride and prejudice prejudice, um, which is a metaphor for the, the, the sparring. Um, Oh, it's so, it's so good. And again, when you are accustomed to that type of dialogue in literature, it is so easily distinguishable in what is, in what is happening. Um, and again, we have a, a female writer. Um, so it's going to have this, this female gaze. It's, it's just so brilliant. Well, if you, if you go and watch, and you can watch this on YouTube, just the the dance that Elizabeth and Darcy do, um, they're they're throwing barbs at each other. I mean, they're looking at each other like they are facing each other down instead of doing a dance at a ball. And dance is a metaphor usually for love. Um, so you have this, yeah, you have. You have this this intimacy that is wrapped around um, this tension of they are both um, attracted to each other, but they're um, they're hindered by certain abilities. Like Ray, it says, I mean, in the very beginning and throughout the novel and the movie, that Ray wanted to take Ben's hand, but she couldn't. She couldn't because uh, Ben was still trapped. In the shell of Kylo Ren. So you see her longing for that. And you see Kylo's longing for Rey. However, the connection, the dyad isn't quite right. Because Ben needs to come back for the connection to feel like home for both of them. So, yeah. And and I think you really see Rey dealing with her dark side where she says she just wanted to land a blow to hurt him. That's not, <laughs> that's really not how a Jedi feels, but he is being more patient and more loving towards her. He, at that very same paragraph, he said, uh, I was palp, I, it was Palpatine who had your parents taken. He said like a patient teacher as though they weren't in a fight of their lives. So he is just letting her take out that rage where she is trying to be patient and just talk to her, but she won't let him. So let's move on to probably the best line of the entire book. In my opinion, <laughs> Let's go to the hangar play, the hangar bay. Okay. He removed his mask, a gesture of vulnerability, of trust. It suddenly occurred to her how long it had been since she'd seen his face. The scar on his cheek had faded, but it would still mark him forever. You know what you need to do, he said. You know. He extended his black gloved hand to her. 
She looked at it, remembered. The last time he'd extended a hand to her had been in the wreckage of Snoke's throne room. Their combined power had defeated him. It was true that together they could do such incredible things. So a little bit. Oh, I'm flipping through my oh book. did you want me to go on? <laughs> Again, he. Do you want me to go on, Em? Yes, please. Okay. Kylo considered it a small price to pay to encounter Ray again, to provoke her into a rage, to say the word dyad and watch the truth of it wash over her lovely face. He hardly paid attention. He kept seeing her face, the way her lips had parted with surprise, the way her body had canted towards him. If the Millennium Falcon hadn't appeared, she might have come to him taken his hand kylo really hated that ship okay folks (laughs) um i i actually have this quote on the screen because i want people to see it if kylo was not attracted to her he wouldn't be talking about her lovely face he wouldn't be talking about her lips being parted uh, he wouldn't be talking about how her way, her body had canted towards him. And that phrase always reminds me of that scene in um, While You Were Sleeping, where he's like, your body, you know, you were leaning yeah. towards him. <laughs> if you, yeah. your body language, <laughs> when it's leaning, um, is like showing acceptance of wanting, of wanting to be with someone. Like you, if you don't want to be with someone, you freeze and you lean back. You like take steps away. But no, she was leaning towards him. And man, man, was he just soaking in all those details as we are. Um, <laughs> the fact that he's even noticing these things. Like yes. if you don't, care about somebody you're certainly not going to notice the fact that they're slightly leaning closer to you you know what i mean you only notice that stuff when you're into somebody oh yeah yeah Yeah, um, i think this was one of the quotes that sorry real quick phantom siren said now the millennium falcon is playing c-3po's role if you know what i mean (laughs) yep (laughs) that's cute what were you gonna say michelle Sorry, this is one of the quotes that um, I have a few uh, close friends that didn't care if I spoiled them on Raylo stuff from the book since I had it a couple of weeks early. And this was one of the passages where they were like, it does not say that in this book. I'm like, yes, it does. <laughs> like They were practically not believing me, thinking that I pulled this out of a fanfic or something. It was so over the like to us over the top yeah oh yeah it's again this is um this is this is straight out of jane austen and and charlotte bronte i mean this this is this is romantic language and not romantic like uh, lovey-dovey, like, oh, I want to kiss you, you want to kiss me, like, but this this is steeped in uh, a, a romance. I mean, this, this much, is... <clears throat> yeah. Pretty much textbook, any enemies to lovers story you've ever read yes. in your life. Yes. Any, and pick one, like, they all have this kind of I hate you, no I don't. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Look yep. at your lips. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, <laughs> come on. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so just the fact that he's being... It's, like, it's 10 things I hate about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's And he's being vulnerable. I mean, look at the description of him when he takes off his mask for her. Um, he sa- She says he removed his mask, a gesture of vulnerability, of trust it suddenly occurred to her how long it had been since he she'd seen his face <laughs> you know? like you don't make that kind of remark 
oh, I haven't seen your face in a long time. You don't make that remark unless you want to see somebody's face. And remember when Ray first saw his his face, when he took off uh, the mask in the interrogation scene, she was like, wow. And she looked him up and down and then she, you know, get, gained her uh, composure once again. But yes, there is some high amount of uh, tension in this. Um, so ladies, is there anything you else want to say, say uh, else want to say about the best line ever? <laughs> That's all. Oh, oh, there's one more. There's, I didn't put it in red. I have, I have a outline that we're using, but he'd been so very close, but now she knew the truth. She would accept it. She would come to understand that darkness was her destiny. Next time he saw her, she would turn. Again, they are both so wanting the other person to be on the same side. Mm-hmm. Like, And that's the only thing that's keeping them apart is Kylo wants her to be dark. Ray wants... Um, been to come back and be light i mean that's why she didn't take his hand because she wants to take ben solo's hand not kylo ren's hand i just wish again and people have said this and i'm going to echo it i just wish she would have said that outright look dude i want to take your hand but i want to take ben's hand and i wish she would have said that um earlier on and i think that's a much healthier way of dealing with it but of course restraint romance and uh when romance is is kept to the depths and instead of the surface like you don't communicate and that's the whole problem is they're not communicating with each other of what they truly want they don't want power over the other they want to be uh in the same the same place as the other Mm -hmm. Cosmic Girl with a super sticker heart. Thank you so much, Cosmic Girl 02. These Skywalkers and their um, communication issues, I just oh. want to wring their necks. It dri- <laughs> this yeah. is going to drive you nuts. <laughs> like if, if people were just see- talking to each other like civilized humans. This I would- know. <laughs> Telling each other who's who your grandparents are, for instance, yeah. is basic information. Can we just put that yep. on the table, please? But no, they can't. Well, it's it's Kylo Ren behaving like irrational, as if she just knew the facts and she accepted the facts. Mm-hmm. She would come over and to my side. And Ray is like, if he just felt who he truly was and became the man he was destined to be, that idealistic talk, then he would come to my side. So you see that, that again, that rational idealist remark. Um, so let's go to, let's leave the force mm-hmm. connections behind and let's go to the Death Star. Um, so inside the star, when she, after Ray encounters the dark side of herself, the dark Ray, um, this is what Kylo says to her. Look at yourself, he said. He was maskless. Somehow, she knew that he would never wear his mask for her again. You wanted to prove to my mother that you were a Jedi. His voice oozed contempt for that notion. But you've proven something else. You can't go back to her now, like I can't. His words cleared her head, because he was wrong. Her darkest self had told her not to be afraid of who she was, but so had Leia. Leia knew, and she had still chosen to train her. Kylo Ren did not understand his mother at all. I thought this was just so heartbreaking because if you look at Adam Driver's performance and he says you can't go back to her now like I can't he almost bursts into tears and I think Ray Carson just puts more salt from crate on our wounds because what Kylo Ren does not understand about his mother is his mother is forgiving and his mother wants him back so Kylo Ren did not understand his mother at all he didn't understand that he could come back to Leia. Mm-hmm. It, oh, gosh, that kills me. 
that kills me. And I think that, again, that just really harkens back to how much he wants her with him because this poor boy just wants connection with another human being. He just wants someone to be with him and for him. It's just, it kills me. <laughs> Do either of you, are you ready to go on to the duel? Or is there something about the inside of the Death Star scene that you want to discuss? I did want to say one thing. If, if anything that I have any criticism at all, and I, I don't even think it's a criticism of of the writer or um, her style or anything like that. I think it's just a criticism of the story itself, which, you know, she was burdened with anyway, um, having to try to make it make sense. But um, the Kylo Ren did not understand his mother at all, all kind of made me bristle a little bit just because I don't know that that's the issue. The I, To me, the issue is... She doesn't know what he's been through and the fact that he's been manipulated his entire life and had Palpatine in his head and all, you know, she doesn't know anything about that. They never discuss it. He never says anything to her about it. So, you know, I, I wish that they had put into the story or maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, something some kind of conversation where he lets her know that that stuff has been happening to him since he was a child. You know what I mean? And it would have given them another bridge to connect, I think, because they both had, you know, childhood issues with parents and bad people in their lives that they could do nothing about. You know what I mean? But that's, again, I was just the story, the way it was laid out, and who knows, maybe she tried to do that, and they said, no, 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 we're not going to interject anything like that yet. But anyway. I was re- hoping that they would have touched somehow again, and they would have seen, like, even the, the audience could have seen that as flashbacks, or, like, Ray could have touched something that belong to Ben, like something back in that trunk at Maz's castle, like, you know, touched it and was able to see the childhood and really get a sense of all the things that he has gone through. And I see a lot of the chat blowing up talking about the Chewy interrogation scene now. Oh, yeah. So I'm wondering if we should pause the Raylo and, and discuss the Chewy. I concur. I concur. Please. Yeah. Um, or do you guys want to take that? Because, again, I, I have not uh, read that part. I mean, I know what happens, but uh, <clears throat> you guys could probably discuss it a bit more eloquently than I could. That part in the book, I lost it. Like, lost it. I didn't, I had no idea that was in there, even, even... Let me try to make sense of what I'm trying to say. When I first got a hold of the book at the convention we were at, and we were just kind of flipping through, we, the, the my three friends and I were at this uh, the convention in Chicago, C2E2, and that's where the early drop of the book happened. So we sat literally sat down on the convention. I'm sorry, guys. I lost connection with Skype. Just hold on and I'll get them back again. <laughs> the Skype application just uh, just closed on my uh, on my uh, computer. But never fear. Guys, that, I, we, we talked about, in, you know, at the convention and I left. I literally got up and left. I'm like, nope, hold on, guys. I'm Look, so s- yeah. Um, the Skype application just completely crashed on my computer, so we missed that discussion. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you're 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 fine. It was my computer that just 
decided to to crash. So um, could you go back a little bit, Michelle, and talk about what you read in the interrogation scene? And then I'm going to send this section to Luthien to read. Okay. Um, I was saying that at C2E2 at the convention in Chicago, my friends and I got the book and we were sitting on the floor just reading spots out of the book. Uh, My friend Shelby was reading it aloud to us for a couple of hours. It was actually like one of my memories like convention memories I'll never forget because it was it was so fun actually to sit there with them and read all this Raylo stuff together and crying and people probably thought we were nuts but anyway when it got to the part where um the second part like there's there's two different Chewie and Ben references in this book the second one is later it's finds a hollow disc of Chewie and baby Ben and when my friend Shelby got to reading that part I had to leave. Like, I yeeted immediately. I was not going to sit there and bawl my head off in public because I have for four years, you guys. This has just been been one of the things that I just, I needed. I needed some acknowledgement of Chewbacca and Ben's relationship. Some, something. So when she read that, started reading it, I just couldn't take so I left. I had no idea this whole other scene of Chewie getting interrogated by kylo even existed so as i'm reading this book like fully a couple days later or the next day when i got to this part i lost my mind like i never cried so hard reading a book ever in my life i just couldn't Ugh! it killed me it killed me like the fact that they do have they did have this very close relationship at one time that nobody has ever acknowledged on the screen I don't know why I think it's kind of an important thing. I don't really know why we've never, they've never even acknowledged each other, you know what, on the screen. It's so weird. We clearly they have this relationship. But anyway, the scene with the interrogation, um, did you guys see the, the art, the concept art of that? Yes, yes it yes. killed me. It, it killed me. I could barely look at it. I could barely even look at it. It made me so upset. And then now to have this actual scene in the novelization, it's not as bad as I thought the art. I thought the art looked really upsetting. Yeah, it did. But this is more like, okay, yes, he's he, he's infiltrating his mind, but I was really afraid there was going to be like physical some sort of physical torture and I couldn't, there's no way I could have handled that. And I don't really think Ben would do that anyway. He was just, no. he was just trying to get to find out where Ray is and yeah, yeah, yeah. He, like I said, he got, he went into his mind and all, but you know, Jedi do that all the time. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I People that make that distinction, that one type of doing that is really bad and the other type is acceptable. I'm like, is it? Because it's a violation either way, in my opinion. But I guess that's yeah. a different topic. Anyway, I just wanted to say, like, this part killed me. Yet I needed it. <laughs> Amy Showers with a super chat. Thank you so much. I half wished they had had this part in the movie, but then I am half glad they didn't have it because of the little Ben and Uncle Chewie. Exactly. Yeah, I I so wanted to see it, though. I I remember when they were filming this movie and we heard a rumor that they cast a little black-haired toddler. And and Luthien and I wanted scenes with baby Ben. And I really believe if they showed that history, like Michelle was talking about, if they showed Leia um, seeing and understanding the torment that Ben went through, if they saw if Ray saw that if we saw the relationship with Chewie if we saw Ben on Han's lap and kind of like how we see baby Yoda and Mando flying uh, flying the ship then people I think would have fallen more and more in love with Ben Solo Um, and perhaps people would um, been more pro redemption been more pro Raylo if they planted those scenes throughout that movie that this boy 
um, was truly loved, but he was kidnapped. I mean, he was kidnapped by the Satan of the trilogy, by death itself. And I, I really feel like so much was hidden and the mystery boxes that they need just to unleash them and let people see so they could cheer for the last Skywalker for the, the last solo. Um, but, uh, People were asking what happens during this interrogation scene. Basically, um, Kylo goes in. The, the novel really speaks of him being fearful of this confrontation. Um, he is trying to get information about Rey um, from Chewie's mind. Um, he said, Kylo says, I have not forgotten that you shot me. And with a wave of his hand, he releases Chewbacca's shackles. Um, and he says, Kylo says, kill me. I'm unarmed. Now's your chance. Have you your revenge for Han Solo? But Chewie didn't rise up. He just, um, he made no move. And he growled dark and low. Uh, he, Kylo starts feeling what... Um, Chewie's love for Ray, and uh, the saddest, saddest line of all time is uh, Ben sees that as Chewie loves Ray like Chewie never loved him, just like Snoke told him, you know, no one loves you, Ben, only I love you. Chewie doesn't love you, your parents don't love you, Luke doesn't love you, but only I love you. And so why Kylo is probing Chewie's mind, um, Chewie decides to, instead of, um, how can I say this? Chewie decides to show, I think, show Ben how he truly loved him. Um, Do you want me to read that part? Yes, yes. Okay. It should have been, well, Kylo's voice crackled with rage. What was her mission? Where is she going? Give me the answer or I'll take it myself. It should have been satisfying to watch Chewbacca wince in fear. Kylo should have felt pleasure in reaching out with the Force, inserting himself into the Wookiee's mind, ripping away his memories and thoughts. Instead, it was a Hey, Luthien, we, we, we don't hear yeah, you. Sorry. I know. I got a phone call. It screwed everything up. Um, where did I stop? Uh, instead, it was exhausting. Yep. Yeah. Instead, it was exhausting. He saw flashes of the Wookiee laughing with a much younger Han Solo than he himself remembered. Felt Chewbacca's joy when his best friend married the woman he'd come to love like a sister. Saw the Wookiee cuddling a human toddler, teaching an older boy to fly a speeder. Target practice with a young man, their blasters set on stun against a haphazard dummy made of rocks. Uncle Chewie, he had called him back then. Nausea rolled around in the pit of Kylo's stomach when he finally walked away from, the, from interrogation six. He'd gotten what he'd needed. Surely the sense of triumph would follow soon, which we know never did. It, it, I added that last part. Yes, <laughs> no, well done. Well done. Um, and like Michelle was saying, we have another Chewy um, and Ben moment. Lando goes around and tours how Han uh, remodel the, the Falcon and Lando is kind of sad because uh, Han remodeled Lando's closet into a chamber, a compartment for for Chewie, and Lando sees like this this compartment that that Lando that Chewie made, and it was like a hidden compartment where you could hide something. And so Lando, being the smuggler he he is, thought, "Oh, I'm just gonna peek in and see what Chewie is hiding in this hidden compartment." And just wait for this, get some handkerchiefs ready, and you'll see why I started crying. Um, I know Michelle cried. <laughs> I, I, away. I refuse to sit there and listen 
to it in public because I knew I was just going to sob like a crazy person. So I, I ran away. I came back like five minutes later. <laughs> I, I'll get rid of everyone. And, I'm a wuss. Three, two, one. <laughs> Inside was a small metal shelf. And on the shelf was a hologram disc. The edges worn with use. It was none of his business. Probably a treasured memory from his homeworld of Kashyyyk. Chewie was over two centuries old, with a long history of family and friends Lando knew nothing about. He started to leave, but stopped. He couldn't resist. He was a scoundrel, after all. Lando reached forward and flicked the hologram switch. An image of Chewbacca himself was projected onto the disc in soft blue. He held a small human child in his arms. Lando leaned closer. It was Ben. Dark-haired, chubby-fisted, he kicked his legs and yanked on Chewie's fur, shrieking in delight. Chewbacca just cuddled him close, making a sound that was almost like a purr. Lando flicked off the hologram. He couldn't watch anymore. The First Order had taken so much from them. From all of them. We do find out later in the novel that and it says so in the movie. I think it does. But um, the whole theme of this book is how so many of the children of the of the rebel, the rebels were stolen um, from the First Order that they the First Order maliciously attacked especially the leaders of the rebels. They attacked and went after Leia and Han's son. They attacked and went after Lando. Um, Lando's child was taken. Um, so many children were lost in, in this war. And, and I really wish that was just really honed in. Again, there's so many coulda, wouldas, and shouldas in episode nine, but wouldn't it have been powerful for that, that to be a theme of this is a lost generation taking their lives back and their parents and grandparents are there to save them. So we have a contrast between people like Sidious and the Sith belief um, willing to sacrifice their children um, mercilessly for the cause. But we have the resistance and the re rebels, these generations coming together to save one another. Mm, Amy showers with the sobbing super chat. Thank you. <laughs> Bob super sticker. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. <laughs> Michelle, do you have any other um, comments that you want to make about the Chewy and, and Ben memories or relationship? Probably nothing more to add. I, like I said, it's, it's just something I've wanted since day one, since The Force Awakens came out and wondered about. And... Um, Lando too, actually. Like I wish there yes. had been some um, a some sort of personal interaction, but you know, to get the chewy stuff was very high on my list of thing of hopes and dreams. So thank you, Ray Carson, for that. I actually got to thank her in person for that, which made me very happy. Oh, while we're on Ray Carson, tell tell them because you met Ray Carson at this convention. Would you tell them the story of what pin you gave you gave her? Oh yeah, um, we went to. She had a a panel with her uh, editor, which was really fun. Her editor is really cool too. Um, and after the panel. I gave her a pin that I actually had these made for the last celebration, but I made some more because they're kind of cute, I guess. People like them. But it's um, it's a pic it's the picture of Kylo from Force Awakens after he takes off his helmet the first time in front of Rey in the interrogation scene. So, you know, he's looking extraordinarily prince-like. And then um, in, on the pin it says Disney Prince in, like, Disney font. So... She clearly likes Ben Solo slash Kylo Ren. Just she tweets about she used to tweet about his hair and stuff all the time, <laughs> even before this book came out. So I gave her one of those pins, 
And she was so sweet about it and literally said, oh, my God, this is my new favorite pin. But, of course, I'm like, you're just, you know, you're just being nice. But then the next day when um, she was having a signing for the novel, we popped by the booth again and she was wearing it. I felt so happy. That's awesome. You have a picture of this on your Twitter feed, right? Because I saw it and I just died. Yeah, of of Ray Carson wearing this pen. I was just like, yeah, she's one of us, one of us, one of us. (laughs) So is. Absolutely no question in my mind. She's one of us. Um, So so good. So uh, now that we uh, spent about 15 minutes crying... (laughs) <laughs> Let's go back to the Death I'm not Star. Crying. My face just happens to be wet. <laughs> I, I I'll be honest. I had a couple of tears that I had to push back. You know, um, cause like you guys, I so wanted that chewy interaction. Man, I just wanted a chewy, uh, a chewy and Ben hug, and I so wanted Lando to say. You know, look, kid, I love you. I did some bad things, too. But come here and give your Uncle Wanwo a hug. <laughs> oh, yeah, that would have been so good if he'd have been like, I was a jerk, too. Yeah, <laughs> they would have connected on that level for sure. And everybody forgave me. So, yes, yes. And just I I, I don't care if we never find out Ben got that blaster from Uncle Wanwo. I believe that's in the visual dictionary. It's not in the book, but I believe it's in the visual dictionary that that is Lando's blaster. I'll have to look and yeah. verify that. And maybe that was just wishful, with your name on it, kid. <laughs> wishful Freudian thinking. <laughs> that that's what that was. But um, I, I believe it is. So um, during the duel and the reason I. Muted that cough and it didn't work. I'm so sorry. Oh, bless you. No, no worries. Um, I, there's a lot of discussion, and I heard that from heard this from many anti Raylos that um, all that Kylo was trying to do was kill her. And I feel like Ray Carson really emphasized the fact that uh, Kylo never was trying to hurt her. <laughs> <laughs> or went after with the full intent to hurt her, but Ray definitely had um, some feelings and emotions of wanting to hurt him and conflict about that. And I felt like this this section of during the duel is so important because it emphasizes that Kylo is not going after her during this duel to hurt her. He's he's basically trying to get her to listen to him and get her all of her frustrations and her anger out. And if you look at the stage the combat choreography she's the one that is going you know central uh central stabs he is just deflecting and whenever he does an offensive move it's always to the sides of her body so he's not trying to to hurt her during the stool so uh luthien friend would you mind reading this little section yep uh real quick another super chat from amy showers I would have loved a Lando and Ben Solo scene of them picking up him up and he tells him, go get your girl like your father got the girl. Uh-huh. That would have been cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for the super chat, Amy. Oops, my mic almost just fell into my face. So that's nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the more of the duel M was talking about. Over and over, she swiped, slammed, stabbed, and he countered with effort, matching her ferocity, but he gave ground. But she pressed her attack, oblivious to the added danger. Kylo Ren had no choice but to attack in kind, and it was so satisfying to strike again and again, only to have their blades clash like cymbals. The impact shivered into her shoulders, bruised her spine and hips. Again, but he gave ground. He gave ground. And he had no chance, no choice but to attack in kind. And the reason that I uh, did the, it, yeah, I just thought that that was, that was very essential to continue to say this is not a, 
this if it were in enemy to enemy this would be they they want to kill each other but since it's enemy to lovers that contents context puts puts this duel in another light that this is just banter and a couple having a fight mm -hmm. she would not leave this place until one of them was dead but her blade was not breaking through his guard she gritted her teeth and attacked him with force energy. He flew backward, caught himself, landed neatly. Kylo advanced, pushing with his own force energy. Her temples began to throb with pain, but she stood her ground. He sent the thought directly into her mind. I know you. No one does, she shot back. But I do. She screamed and launched herself at him again. He was physically stronger the longer they fought, the clearer it became. But she was a little faster. Again, I think he was just trying to wear her out because she, he was stronger than her. Now, ladies, what I wanted to ask you is, this is the scene where we hear it in the trailer. We hear that no one knows me, but I do scene. So why do you think Disney edited that line out of the film, out of this scene? Because we would have face painted. <laughs> they left it in. I love that. We, no. <laughs> we would have all perished and just poof into a little puffs of smoke. Yep. I really don't know. I I find it so annoying that they cut it out. I don't under I don't know why they would have cut that out. It really maybe because it was too romantically on the nose? I, I don't know. I would love to know. Luthien, do you have any thoughts? I can't say it in the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you tweet? I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be really honest. I can't say it publicly. <laughs> well, you're gonna be messaging me later, please, about what you really think about that, because I would love. I need insight on why they would cut that, because I don't. I don't get it. I feel. The only thing I can say is that I feel it was on purpose to give it to us in the trailer and then to not have it in the movie, I feel it was done on purpose. Hmm. Yeah. There, I can see that. There was a, <laughs> there was a lot of, a lot of rail, I mean, you know, in Vanity Fair, J.J. Abrams said that the relationship between Ray and Kylo Ren was the heart, the core of this film. We also saw the Vanity Fair covers. We saw uh, again and again them talking about the desperate relationship, the intense relationship. So it did feel like there was a practiced... Um, we, 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 we had a lot of amuse bushes <laughs> amuse bush, that we were going to get a lot of Raylo content in this movie and it just seemed like they took a lot of that away from us and the but I do is a example of that like I would have loved to seen that scene and again that would have just reinforced the Raylo connection that they they know each other intimately. I, a lot of people talk about, well, they really don't know each other. They really don't know each other. And, and again and again, the creators are trying to tell us, look, they know each other more than a husband and a wife knows each other here on earth. Because they have, like Jason Fry said, they've been in each other's minds. They have seen what the other has seen. They have felt what the other has felt. This is, this is, this dyad relationship is stronger than um, what we know and we realize. And please, like Disney, give us novels about that. Like flesh out that idea of what the dyad is and, and, and give us, feed us, please. We need to be fed with the dyad nourishment. Um, totally. <clears throat> Sally Beth with a super chat. Thank you so much. Um, don't apologize about plugging your fanfic. We all need some uh, stuff to dive into. She goes, sorry again for the plug, but I really believe my fic can help those who are distressed. So guys, gals, if you want to read some good fanfic, click on Sally Beth's link to her archive of our own page and read her fanfic because it'll 
it'll help the healing process. 100% Star Wars in the house. Hey. Nice. I saw you were here for a very long while, um, but now I'm finally able to say hello. Um, He says to have their voices kind of playing over a fight without the actual dialogue being spoken would have caused some confusion to more casual fans. I can see that. I can see that. I, um, given their, all that's happening, um, I think it would have been a bit confusing for casual fans, but you can certainly, just like in Lord of the Rings, where Galadriel was, was speaking, um, in the book, you know what she's saying to to the Fellowship uh, when they first meet her, and she's speaking in everyone's mind. In the movie, all you see is her speaking to, when here, her speaking to Frodo. I think they could have done that um, strategically, where you could get that they're, they're speaking to each other in their minds. Um, there's there's recognition of that. I think it could have been done, but you know, should have could have was. I mean, it's in the, it's over and done with now. Um, but at least we got the but I do's in the in the book and yeah. Rhonda with a book says Galadra Rael. <laughs> Am I right? Oh oh. <laughs> we see you. We yeah. see you, Rhonda with the with the book. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Um, okay, so let's go on to some more Ben Dimshin goodness and um, go. Oh, we forgot a, a the the healing again. The healing of Ray and Ben has some very um, finger touching goodness. <laughs> And it all sorts of of uh, touchy feely goodness. Uh, Michelle, would you like to go into that a little bit? Yeah, I'm sitting here trying to think what words can I use. Uh, I would just say that the two, <clears throat> excuse me, this this whatever I have just will not leave me alone, and the throat stuff is killing me. So I apologize for all the throat clearing and coughing. Um, but I would say that the two passages from the book, uh, first when Ray heals Ben and then later when, uh, Ben heals Ray are very similar in the verbiage in that they, um, I'm going to paraphrase cause I don't have those pages super handy, but it's like they gave their whole selves to one another. Ray Ray mm-hmm. says to Luke on when she goes to Actu that she would have given her whole self, given her life to heal him if she had had to. And then later it it describes Ben pouring his whole self into Ray to heal her. So you know, that's to me some subtextual stuff that Ryan Johnson would highly approve of and probably really like because he likes that kind of subtext a lot. It seems from The Last Jedi. I feel like that is a good example of so much of the um, the critique of us Raylos is that we read too much into things. Well, a lot of us saw the finger touching scene as a metaphor for something more intimate before um, Ryan Johnson said it was the closest thing to a um, blank scene <laughs> than you'll see in a Star Wars movie. And so I would just say to people who don't see it this way, like really look at the metaphors of if it's, it's a Star Wars It's meant for families as much as possible. So we're not ever going to have a scene like that spelled out for us. But metaphorically, that's what in an ideal world um, two people give to each other during those moments. Exactly. And, you know, these people are artists. They're filmmakers. They're writers. They 
they do metaphor, they do subtext, like that's part of the art of their crafts. So it is there for those people that want to look for it and, and see it. Like what, this is what happens when you take a literature class, right? You're reading yeah. these great novels and it takes you a month to study Romeo and Juliet because there's more there than just the surface level story. That's art. That's what these people do for a living. That's what they, you know, they study their whole lives to get good at that. So, yeah, exactly what, what you were saying. We're never going to get a full-on, you know, scene like that in Star Wars, ever. And I would just say that um, Kirshner, the guy that directed uh, Empire Strikes Back, mm -hmm. and this was 1980 he was saying this, that a kiss in Star Wars... <laughs> is equivalent to, you know, a very intimate scene in any other kind of a movie because that's as, that's as intimate as they're going to get. A kiss is the height of intimacy in Star Wars. He's and the Ryan Johnson of his time. <laughs> he was, Oh, my gosh, that guy. I love that guy. Have you guys ever, like, read about him or read some of the stuff a he used bit. to talk about? He's awesome. He yeah. was so fun. And but I anyway, think... anyway, yeah, it's like... The hand touching and the kissing, like that's, I don't know what everybody expects to happen, but that's about, that's, that's the height. We're not going to go past that. Amy Shower sent us a super sticker. Thank you so much. The little cute fox laughing. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, she sent another one again. So there were two little laughing foxes. Thank you so much. Um, that reminded of me of SNL, like old school, like Dan Aykroyd and uh, what's his face? Oh my God, why can't I think of his name? Bill Murray. No, uh, Steve Martin. Were they oh, the right. uh, brothers from Czechoslovakia? <laughs> yeah, we were looking for hot American boxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I what I loved about the healing scene on the on the uh, Death Star is, and didn't Joseph Campbell say the only, I think it was Campbell, the only person who can heal a wound is the mm -hmm. one who inflicted it? Yes, yep. ma'am. Look at what she did. Not only did she heal the wound she caused him um, in his side, but she heals the wound that she caused on his face, the scar um, that heals the minute she heals him his his um his mortal wound it heals the scar on his face oh like oh, that's that's, the, that's like one of the one things jj and terrio i feel got right uh as far as joseph campbell is the one who inflicted the wounds is the only one who can truly heal them oh mm -hmm. man that and was i love so in the good. book too that her just the way ray carson just describes how it felt to be healed and how he yes. felt better than he's ever felt in his entire yep. life like physically mm -hmm. felt so perfectly wonderful even though he was you know psychologically struggling but I loved that she made a point to say that that's just it was just lovely writing a lovely bit of writing mm-hmm Yeah, I love that. And again, when Ben does turn, um, he said, you know, but his mind was in turmoil. He hadn't known such healing was possible, didn't understand how it had been done. But that wasn't the question that troubled him most. Why had Ray healed him? Why would she do such a thing? Why had his mother loved him right up until his last moments? Snoke had lied about that. Snoke had lied about all of it. All those voices in his head torturing him throughout the years. They had promised that a moment like this could never happen. They don't care about you. Just their precious new republic. And later, just their precious resistance. All were lies. His mother had sacrificed herself to reach him. Then Ray had healed him, a great cost to her, herself, in spite of everything 
he did he done he had failed to kill the light within him it had been all around him all along and ray his mother and everyone i feel like that kind of goes back to the fact that um you know when ray says you know your mother does know the darkness in me and um kylo says you know he didn't know his mother at all I feel like that, again, kind of re, it, it is what Michelle is like said, like, um, his mother does not understand. But um, it also talks about how he doesn't understand that, um, how much his, his mother um, loves him as well. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. There's a, a little bit of emergency at my home right now. So <laughs> I need to go and, and talk to a person about this. Like, it can't wait. I, I like I officially got a note for my family member of like, I have to go and check on this. So um, can you guys talk about the fight on Exegol and the connection that Ben and Ray share on in that moment? Yes, of course. Yes. So, continuing on, uh, the fight on Exegol, Ben enters Exegol, and he encounters the Knights of Ren. What I love about this is his thoughts during this, really quickly, for the briefest moment, Ben actually thought they'd come to help. But hate rolled off them in waves like fetid air. Oh, I love that line. The Knights of Ren had, had never been his. They had belonged to the Emperor all along. A final betrayal. Snoke had been nothing more than a pawn. The Emperor had whispered poison to Ben his whole life. So what I love that acknowledgement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just love the acknowledgement that she gives that um, in many, many times in this book, this time included, where she's just hammering home the fact that he was groomed and manipulated and made to feel worthless and made to feel that his family didn't love him anymore. He wasn't worthy of their love anyway. You know, all of these things that, you know, people that love this character have been saying for years now are Mm -hmm. finally canon. Like, that is what definitely happened. It wasn't that he just was being selfish or, or had, you know, I don't want to throw Anakin under the bus, but (laughs) right, right. I will just a tiny bit. I love Anakin. I don't want to (laughs) completely make him out to be a horrible person, but in his case, the impetus for him turning was a selfish reason. I mean, yes, again, I have sympathy for him because he had lost his mother and they had taken him as a child and all of that. But it was, in essence, because he didn't want to lose Padme. In this case, I see it very differently. I see it as a, this kid didn't have a chance. He really did not. Like, there mm-hmm. there were just too many factors in his downfall for me to look at them as kind of an equal thing. And a lot of people try to make it equal, but I don't see it that way. How about you? Oh, I agree. I definitely agree with with everything you just said, like, practically took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> um, Jedi Princess K asks, does Ray Carson explain how Ben got a hyperspace uh, capable tie that worked and got to Exegol without a wayfinder? Yes, she actually does. It almost Uh, at least for me reading that section, it felt like she was kind of forced to throw it in there. Like it was a a quick explanation of how he did it. Like apparently he rummaged through the Death Star and just like in not so many words, by the grace of God, was able to find a a working or tie that he was able to get working. And then he was able to uh, track Ray. But then all of a sudden that didn't work. So he was lost in space for a little bit. But then he was able to like find her. Um, Can you explain that moment just a little bit better, Michelle? Like, do you remember? I know he got like lost in space. 
Um, yeah, actually, I, I kind of loved that little part where he gets lost. And, like, of yeah. course he does. Cause he's a solo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was a very solo moment for him. It was. And I don't really think it addresses the fact that the, the ties back then did not have hyperspace capability. We were just... We're just glossing over that, people. Yeah. I, they're just not going to acknowledge that that was a thing, I guess. I don't know. But, it, yeah, like you were saying, he he has to find a hangar bay on the Death Star. And then he finds yeah. one. And then he finds a, a, a salvageable TIE fighter. And I think it does say that he tracks Ray's transmission. You know how she transmitted yes. the way to the Resistance? I think, he yes. sa- I think it says he picked up on those transmissions somehow. But yeah, he gets yeah. kind of lost because the tie is, you know, an old piece of junk that he just kind of fixed somehow magically. <laughs> yeah, it, it just felt really kind of uh, explained away. And even though he had a great solo moment and getting lost in space for a little bit, um, mm-hmm. besides that, it was just like, wah, wah, like, okay. I yeah, like, I mean, it's the same with. The- the same with the X Wing. It's like you really you expect me right. to believe this is actually like, we'll happening. Off. Um, and now it's underwater for six years. Was, yeah, we're supposed to. Okay, okie dokie. <laughs> Smith the Sun with a super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, come back to us and then a, a heart uh, heart symbol. Um, I assume you mean Ben Solo or. Um, not sure, but thank you for the super chat, Smith the Sun. Also a wonderful patron, Patreon supporter. All right. Jedi Princess K, LOL, thanks for going through that part, ladies. Smiley face. You're welcome. Uh, moving on uh, to the fight on Exegol. Uh, Ray watched her grandfather's dawning horror as he finally realized his mistake, allowing Ray and Ben to come together. Their bond refined in the fire of mutual searching. Oh. What I can't handle about that is if they're coming together, physically coming together is supposed to be so strong. And now he has been solo, so it's even stronger than than realized. I wish they would have defeated him together obviously and one has the perception um or this perspective of looking at it like well ray was always meant to and ben's ben's destiny was to save ray then it works for me personally it did not work because if they're this such this powerful dyad then they should have defeated the greatest evil together they needed each other to do that just like they needed each other to defeat um the Praetorian guard in the throne room. Um, and Ben knew it walking in there. He knew he couldn't do that himself and he needed Ray to accomplish that. The same thing must, should have happened against Palpatine where it was both of them. If they are both the chosen one and yes, Anakin is still the chosen one I'm saying as far as a couple, if they are the dyad, if they are the chosen one, then two become one and they should have done it together instead of Ben just being yeeted down a pit and this is my perspective of it. Um, but I heard you saying amen, Michelle, so you agree. <laughs> I say amen, too. Oh, I'm yay, sorry. Yay, yay, you're back. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't. Uh, I, oh, God, it pissed off. I couldn't believe that they split them up like that. Ooh, I just, man, why, 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 why? Don't tell me for two hours that this dyad is amazing and powerful. And even in in the novel, it even goes further, in my opinion, to say Mm -hmm. just how powerful they are when they're together. Like, this dyad power is something else that we have never seen before, you know? Why are you going to all that trouble to tell me that and then have it it literally does not pay off in any way. The The only way that it pays off is that it gives Palps the power to destroy, you know, it resurrects him more and brings him back to life. Like, do not put that in there. Do not, do not sully the good name of Raylo. 
by well, the making fact it. that they were fully they were fully together, ready to take on Palpatine, that power should have been realized. That power should it shouldn't have just been Palpatine with a flick of his hand forcing them to their knees and right. extracting yeah. like freaking dark crystal like their essence out of them and then pulling Ben up and yeeting him into the pit. That made no sense logistically. And uh, it, it, it just yoinked the, the cannon that they just fed us down the pit with <laughs> <Right>. Ben. <laughs> exactly. So frustrating. Taking oh crazy my pills. I'll never get over it, like, ever. That's just one of those things where I'm like, you know, I can I can compartmentalize some things, but you just spent three movies telling me that they are amazing together, and now you're saying that they're not that amazing together, that she, she can do it on her own. Like I, it, like you said, makes no sense. Sorry, Jajerio, makes no sense. Jajerio, yeah, exactly. So, now I- I'm trying to find your comment. I just, sorry, I'm back. Can you post that again, Sally Beth? Um, oh, I found it. Anakin turned to the dark side because he was afraid of losing the one thing he loved. Ben turned because he thought he already lost everything. Oh, gosh. It's so true, though. It's so true. It's true. Mm hmm. It's the reverse Anakin. No no swearing in the chat, guys. (laughs) Keep it, keep it uh, PG. All right. More Raylo connection. Moving on. Did we have anything to to say about anything else? Um, just that I loved about the, um, I think it's <clears throat> earlier when he first arrives, when Ben first arrives on Exegol, and Ray is, like, already, you know, throwing down with Palpatine, and she feels a little, I don't remember what the book, the wor- words are exactly, but she feels him arrive, basically, and yes. sends him like a quick little oh my god I, I'm so happy you're here and you're. I can tell you're Ben again and, and then she has to close it off because she doesn't want Palpatine to realize that they're you know communicating back and forth but just that just all of that and how you know the oh and when he's dropping into the um, down the big giant chain thing mm, um, mm-hmm how he calls upon the force like he knows if he just falls it's too far to just fall so he calls upon the force and drops and just puts his faith in the force that everything that he'll be fine that way all of that stuff is it, it surprises me oops sorry I'm going. no that's okay it surprises me because in the snoke comic uh, you see when when Snoke holds him over a precipice and Ben or Kylo falls and he was able to catch himself. I just wonder why they put that there if Ben couldn't catch himself in both situations. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like I, I wish mm-hmm. I wish like when he was eated down a pit. Um, ben would have caught himself. Um, maybe he was just too drained at that moment that he couldn't have the awareness to to do that. But yeah, I love the the um, faith drop of the, in the force or the faith fall. I think that was a really good um, moment. Mm-hmm. Going on in the novel, she lifted her saber as if to strike and reached for the connection she shared with Ben, showed him. He acknowledged her, and Ray's lips parted in surprise. It felt different now. The connection was right, good, like coming home. Ben was similarly stunned, and together they wasted a precious moment reveling in this new sharing. This is how it should have been all along, a true dyad. 
She drew on Ben's strength and he drew on hers, and just like before, they were separate but also together, Ray battling guards, Ben battling the knights. Behind you, she warned, and he brought up his saber to block his back. Over his falling body, spun and did the same to Ushar. He stared at the bodies of his fallen former comrades. Then he sprinted for the throne room. As Ray used the force to collapse a guard under his own weight and then throw him back into the darkness. She deflected another blaster bolt, dodged another. She spun to face the final guard, but Ben got there first and tossed him aside like a piece of garbage. They stood facing each other for the space of one breath, two, together at last. Ben was different, relaxed, unguarded. How had Ray not noticed before that he had the long faced and posture of his father, the warm brown eyes of his mother? <laughs> I think that's such a callback to the bridge moment in the novelization of The Force Awakens because Han sees the exact same thing. He comments about how he hasn't seen his son since his son was a young boy and now he's a man and he sees his son's face and he has the long jaw like his and but his eyes were black and cold and dark and uh and hungry and they weren't like the warm brown uh that he inherited from his mother and i think that's again it's a sign that ben solo has returned because his eyes are no longer black they're the warm brown eyes of his mother Oh. I I also think it's so beautiful that the connection was was good, like coming home. And wasn't that what Ray wanted all along? She wanted a home. She wanted yeah. that that place of comfort and peace and connection and warmth. And isn't that what we say to people that we love? Like we say that to um our husband or our wives like you know meeting you seeing you it feels like home to me it feels like home to me and we say that to people like we may lose a physical building but as long as I'm with you I'm at home because you are my home (laughs) how you doing Michelle (laughs) <laughs> i'm trying to keep it together it'll just make my nose run more if i start crying oh yeah oh this yeah. book is good you guys this book is really good thank you ray carson <laughs> and i totally understand like i i've seen a lot of criticism and i completely understand most of it you know but obviously I just I have a different perspective and I just all all this stuff that she put in she didn't have to put this stuff in there you know it could have been more clinical it could have been much more clinical about you know the dyad and what that means and you know but she put these layers of emotion and um connection in there I think because that's what the film was totally missing in my opinion there wasn't enough of that it was too much bickering it was too much fighting so that when they finally do you know align on Exegol it's too fast like it's over in like a snap there's no we, we get none of this in the film in my opinion I didn't get it anyway what do you guys think Amy Showers sent a super chat. Thank you, Amy. OMG, okay, the audio audiobook actually gave more. It does give Ben thinking, hey, come on, guys, rather than the Han Solo shrug. Interesting. We know that they uh, had to go back and edit the book some more. So I wonder if some things uh, kind of uh, didn't get deleted. <laughs> In the audio book, because I, I know when I was narrating, I had to go back because the author 
change some things. So I had to reread sections. So I, that's very possible that when they were going through the editing process that they forgot to edit a phrase here and there. So maybe that's just another way of saying that we need to go and, and listen to the audiobook because there might be some nuggets <laughs> here and there that we want yeah. to read. Do we know if and when a junior novel is coming out? Oh, that's a good question. No, I don't remember them. I remember her saying that, she, I think, unless I'm being senile, I think she said that when she met with some people at Lucasfilm that the person writing the junior novel was also at that meeting. Mm. I think, I think, don't, oh God, don't quote me on that. I think that's what she said at the panel. Um, the so one is coming. I just I don't know who's writing it. And I don't know when. The uh, Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker Junior novel will be out April the twenty first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. I just looked at it yeah, on sure. Amazon. Another super chat. This is why I have the hard copy audiobook and Kindle versions. <laughs> oh my gosh! Go you. Yep. If you see anything else like that, Amy, that is a little bit different than the audiobook, um, between the like a discrepancy between the audiobook and the novel, would you be our uh, informer <laughs> and let us know? Because <laughs> that's really, I, I love that. Uh, that's really interesting. Star Wars Santa says probably more Finn Ray in the junior novel. <laughs> Star Wars Santa, our friend. <laughs> A resident in Ray Shipper, who we did a wonderful Patreon live stream with last night. It was awesome. So thank you, Star Wars Santa. That was so much fun. Such a good stream. We did a, a deep, deep, deep dive into those pages where Ray and Ben, uh, Ben gives his life to Ray and they kiss and... I don't know how much we want to uh, go into that in, in depth, but I thought if it's okay with you ladies that we really talk about how Ray describes, Ray Carson describes the kissing scene and how that is not a scene, a kissing scene of gratitude that Ray is saying so much more than than just uh, those small little fragments. I feel like... It's, it's like reading and watching a movie. It's all, a lot of it has to do with a lens that you read through. You know, we have all sorts of lenses that we, that help us or, or color our, how we partake things. And I feel like people who saw that scene as a scene of gratitude, um, read that phrase and just saw the word gratitude and didn't read the rest of what was being said and in context. Um, so I was, what, what do you guys feel? Do you want to do another deep dive into those two pages or do you want to just concentrate on the kissing scene? It's entirely up to you guys. I could talk about this forever, uh, you know, whatever you guys want to do. I of course will be on board. Um, we're, we're, uh, going to be pushing two hours soon um let's do it we haven't gotten shut down yet <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah. i forgot to quote this on my outline or it could have just been fatigue one or the other but um i'm just going to kind of um read some sections of this uh I, I feel like it is just, it is just such a beautiful moment. Um, and again, I, I heard a lot of people talk about how um, it was sad to them because you hear Ben going back and forth into his like self-hatred mode or self-blaming mode. But I just love how whenever he talks back in doubt, um, the truth comes back to answer him. Um, when when he goes to Ray, uh, 
Ray's skin was growing cold. Her barren eyes stared up at him and he imagined them accusing him. You did this. This is your fault. No, Ray would never be that way. Those thoughts were the vestige of Snoke's conditioning. Ray was good, kind. No matter what happened between them, what he'd done, she always showed him compassion. Um, he looks around the cathedral to um, to see if he could find any help. Um, but it was just the aching emptiness and a sense of loss so sharp and terrible. It was like a vise around his gut. Um, I did a big word search on this about how gut is used because I noticed that when it talks about Kylo Ren, they talk a lot about a gut um, reaction and gut is actually a a Latin word that is the same word as the heart, the emotion, and we hear that a lot. Like I feel it in my heart or I feel it in my gut. Like it's a instinctual core reaction, and I can post the etymology of it. But I just thought that was beautiful is is when Ben is with Ray or when he feels emotionally or intensely intensive it's like he feels it in his gut in the very core of his being and I thought that was um a really good uh, description that Ray Carson put in there um uh so the force hadn't taken her yet Um, He cradled her gently and placed his hand on her abdomen, again, her, her gut. So it's like his heart is going into her heart. He closed his eyes, called on the force. Ben didn't have much strength left, and he was about to do something he'd never done before. Fortunately, Ray had shown him how to give. And again, it's like what you said, Michelle, he was she was pouring into him and then he returned and poured into her. And again, uh, this is um, a very intimate moment and even closer and more intimate than the finger touching scene and then the healing scene and now it's the sacrificial healing scene it's like they're progressing in their intimacy um his uh they stared at each other a moment oh sorry guys um He waited for her to understand what had just happened. It would be okay if she just left him behind now, got on with her life without a backward glance at him. It's what she should do. Instead, she smiled and whispered, Ben. So again, it's him, you know, speaking a self-doubt. And then she answers right back that she's glad to see him, that um, she was glad his heart was full as Ray reached for his face. Again, it's the pouring into the heart. Let her fingers linger against his cheek. And then wonder of wonders, she leaned forward and kissed him. A kiss of gratitude, acknowledgement of their connection, celebration. They found, they found each other at last. To me, that sounds like a wedding vow. Um, and I looked up different wedding vows, um, on the computer. And one thing that I noticed was a lot of brides and grooms, when they exchange wedding vows, they would be like, I'm so thankful that I found you. Um, and it's like, we have a connection, like we understood each other and we speak the same language. And now we stand here and we do the ceremony because it's a celebration that we found each other at last. So the people who just concentrate on gratitude don't look at the full description of gratitude, acknowledgement of a connection and celebration. And uh, like, go look at wedding vows. That's exactly what brides and grooms say to each other. Well done, Ray Carson. Well done. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is there anything that you ladies would like to add to that? I can't think of it, anything. I think you covered it very nicely. Um, oh, well, I guess I lied. There is one thing. Um, <laughs> I'm a liar. I just lie. Um, 
when we were at C2E2 and got to this passage, I will say that uh, at least one or two of the four of us was like, oh, that word's going to cause trouble. Like, immediately thinking as somebody who, <clears throat> excuse me, um, isn't into Raylo, they, they latched on to that word immediately, like, this is going to be used to say that this was a thank you kiss. Like, they knew immediately what that word was going to cause. It was going to cause a ruckus. But, like you've been saying, I think that's just, if you take that word and that one part of that passage and isolate it, the rest of the book, the rest of that page even, I think it lets us know pretty clearly that this was not a thank you kiss. Like, they are intimately connected on a much deeper level than that. If you take the whole thing as a whole, it's it's obvious to me. I don't know. Well, it's I understand. Thing. It's every wonderful uh, adjective out there. And what is what does gratitude mean? It comes from the word. It's a state of being grateful mm-hmm. and thankfulness, not a, as like a a thank you kiss, but you are grateful and thankful for this connection. Like she is finally acknowledging it 110 percent thankful mm-hmm. and grateful for this and you're so welled up in your mo- in your emotions and you know finally i can kiss ben solo i people are are need to you know look in the dictionary <laughs> a state of being grateful mm-hmm. thankfulness Ugh. a state of pleasing yeah a state of pleasing because that is a, an anglo-saxon word and the root is you know thankful but also another synonym is pleasing it's like a state of being pleased yeah yes and I have to know, too, since you guys are into musicals, Wonder of Wonders, Miracle of Miracles. Oh, yes, From Fiddler on the Roof. The <laughs> yes, yes. That made me laugh, actually. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if she's into, uh, that's another question for Ray Carson. Are you a Fiddler on the Roof stan, Ray Carson? Yes, if, if you I don't. I to say that, that Ray Carson even acknowledged the the grateful term on her Twitter account, uh, which we covered in our uh, novelization discussion two weeks ago. But she pretty much said, don't mind me, I just usually, uh, I can't remember what she, what she said, but she poked fun at it. Like, you guys, I use the term grateful more than just, you know, or gratitude. Like, it's more than, you know, look up the word and put it in context. She says she kisses her husband with gratitude all every day. Like, I kiss my husband with gratitude every day. And then she says, well, I, you know, and I'm not confirming anything with, like, a winky <laughs> face. So, you know, I think I think they're trying to keep Raylo ambiguous because of the um, the fight that is going on right now. Like, I don't think they want to uh, isolate one side of the fandom or another. They're really trying to keep everyone happy. <laughs> but instead, they, they, they make no one happy. So going uh, along with um, Ben Solo had no regrets as he clasped to the ground. The force reached for him in welcome His final awareness was of Ray clasping his hand with her own. Oh, gosh. Um, Ray stood over the place Ben had fallen, staring down at his empty tunic. Tears streamed down his face. And I know, Michelle, that uh, was a very important um, passage for you. Can you explain why and sort of uh, Ray Carson's uh, note on why it was important to read the last couple of pages. That's right. I forgot about that story this time because we kind of went over it in the last time, but that 
got shot into the ether. Um, yeah, when we were at C2E2, and uh, my friend Shelby actually asked um, Ray Carson, as a Bendemptionist and a Raylo, why should I want to read this novelization? Knowing that we did not care for the film, you know what I mean? And she said, okay, well, if you read the last chapter, the last few pages, that should give you an inclination as to whether or not this book is going to be for you. So um, when we, after the panel, we went back to the booth. Or no, I'm sorry, that's wrong. We did buy the book before the panel. Um, but we went to the booth and... I'm, I don't, I didn't really want to get completely spoiled, so I just grabbed a book and I kind of opened it. This is what, page 238, so it's towards the end. And my eyes landed on that passage. It just went straight, I don't, I don't know why, it just went straight to that, I guess because of the, the paragraph break, yeah, maybe, just, anyway, I read those lines that you just said and slammed the book shut and handed him my credit card <laughs> because <laughs> the 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 missing one of the things missing from the film that really bothered me the most was that Ray isn't shown mourning for literally the loss of half of her soul mm-hmm. which makes no sense so when i saw those lines I'm like well even if there's nothing else in this book that i like that sold it for me because I wanted that so much in the film and didn't get it. So she was right in reading the last part of the book. It's very, <clears throat> excuse me, it's very um, comforting is the word that I felt. Mm. Amy Showers sent a, another crying <laughs> super sticker. Mm, thank <laughs> oh, <no. Amy. laughs> Cosmic. But I mean, maybe it's, it's okay. Good. It's okay. We're all doing it together. We definitely are. We definitely are. A Cosmic Girl 02 says, Does she explain why there is no Ben Force Ghost? No, this novel does not talk about ben, uh, Ben's Force Ghost. If there was one or if there isn't one. And I am happy about that. Like, I am happy that they leave that in uh, the land of ambiguity. Because that means that he could come back to me. I think if... If he that we saw him as a force ghost either either in the movie or the book, then that would close the the issue. That you know he's he's done. He's one with the force. You know there's no chance of him returning. Um, how do you feel, Michelle, about that? That there is no mention of Ben Ben's force ghost in the novel. I have changed my attitude about that. 180 degrees like completely because again watching the movie i was outraged <laughs> that he was not there with luke and leia at the end as a force ghost just flipping tables left and right i was so angry about it and since then i've like you're saying there are so many little th- you know seeds here and there that they're just leaving the door open. It's it's really, I've completely changed my mind about it. Like, that is why he's not there at the end, as a force ghost. That's, you know, that is why, well, I can't say that is why. But, and I think I tweeted about this, like, I really don't want to be a clown again. Like, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be a clown again. But I, I'm looking at it, you know, as evidence of you know logically like well why would they do that why wouldn't they have him at the end why wouldn't you know there's just why are we getting the sympathetic backstory after the fact if he's truly dead forever and we're never going to see Ben Solo again you know what I mean it's just it I'm trying to be optimistic I guess but stay cautiously optimistic because again I don't want to be 
hoping for 20 years that Ben Solo is coming back. <laughs> and then I'm like an 80-year-old woman, like, where's Ben Solo? <laughs> Mm. Sorry, it, Shower it, sent it, three super stickers. One was a, a cute little fox again who was rubbing his cheeks, and then there were two crying sticker emojis. So mm-hmm. thank you, Amy Showers, for all those. And we also have um, another super chat from Minwa. He'll come back, smiley face. Thank you so much, Amy Showers, and thank you so much, Minwa, for those super stickers and the super chats. Yeah, Shelby, who was with you at the convention, she said that when Ray, and this is in the book, that when Ray is uh, seeing or hearing from the Jedi, that um, she was, it was like a window was opening and uh, they were calling from a place between places. Uh, And that sounds a lot like a world between worlds. And then I'm going to share the show this again. And I'm going to show this until the cows come home or more uh, appropriately (laughs) until Ben Solo comes home. But uh, Vic Mahoney uh, on December 30th quoted out beyond right, out beyond wrong. There is a place. I'll meet you there. And that line the poem, a place yeah a place yeah. that line out beyond right out beyond wrong there's a place i'll meet you there that was on the rise of skywalker mood board in the upper center of that mood board and again uh that poem uh Rumi is a great wagon it talks about how um People are crossing in and out of a doorway that going across the threshold, that door is round and open. And Rumi kind of has a sense that there's this other parallel world that you can walk in and out of a dimension. So I I can be, I'll, I'll be a clown if it keeps me hopeful and optimistic. <laughs> I will be a fool for love in this instance because I want, I want baby Ben to come back. What do you think, Luthien? I agree. <laughs> agree. <Double>. Certified. <laughs> I agree. 100%, 100%. Well, and the other thing that I keep coming back to in my mind is that this whole dyad thing is new stuff. You know, there are no rules because it's new. It's a new force thing that we haven't seen in canon anyway um, since the sequel trilogy started. So they can do whatever they want with this. It's, and again, you know, like you're saying, the world between worlds, I was convinced that that was going to be in the film. And it was. And I mean, it was. That's where all those voices were coming from. It's exactly what happens in Rebels. He hears all the voices. Ezra hears all the voices as he's walking into the world between worlds. Is it flat out obvious like that? No, but if you're a fan and you've seen Rebels and you're aware of the world between worlds, it's, I mean, and I think Ray Carson makes it really, really obvious that that's what they were talking about. So they can do whatever they want. And the basis of this dyad is that, together they have the power of life itself like palps freaking says it and he uses it to resurrect his body so what are we dealing with here we're dealing with a super powerful couple that we don't really know what how this works or how it doesn't work and they possess the power of life they healed each other i mean how much more opening do they need you know i think they're giving themselves a wide berth to do whatever they want and clearly people love ben solo so hmm i guess we'll see he's money he's money i mean the rise of kyle ren comics have sold out um poll after poll after poll shows that Kylo Ren was the one that they were most excited. People were the most excited to see. Like the last time I looked at that poll on StarWars.com, 
it was like 96% of the people were the mo- were excited to see Kylo Ren and the rise of Skywalker and bless Ray <laughs> only like 3% were excited to see her so i th- i think that they know Ben Solo is money and hopefully that will urge them to create more material. Yes. So ladies. Yes. (laughs) A thousand voices. Yes. Live in you now. I just was about to say that. And then I realized that makes no sense whatsoever. So yeah. I don't know why that came into my mind, but there we go. Um, So, ladies, we have gone for almost two hours. Um, (laughs) After we read Amy Shower's uh, uh, showers of of generosity, um, is there anything else that we want to talk about before we end this live stream? I think we hit it. So, Amy... Amy Showers says, go for it, friend. If they bring back Ben Solo, my wallet will float up and open all on its own, and all my credit cards will come flying out. (laughs) Amy, (laughs) control yourself, girl. (laughs) I have to say same. Yeah. 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 Easily. I will I will empty the coffers for for Ben Solo. I have to admit, I I have a um, I'm ready for that Ben Solo merchandise. Like, come on, they they uh, gave us the Ben Solo rollout. If you haven't seen that, oh, it is the cutest oh thing. You you see baby Ben piloting the Falcon. You see baby Ben um, drawing on with crayons on the floor. Like, I just can't handle it. <laughs> And I apologize to Matt Martin. I think I asked him no less than three times in the last, I don't know how many months, are we ever going to see, is is baby ball Ben ever going to see the light of day? Or is this another Forces of Destiny Raylo episode that is locked in a vault somewhere that we're never going to see? And he just kept saying, it's coming. Oh my God, leave me yeah. alone. It's coming. Go away. And like, dropped. So are they never going to show us the Forces of Destiny Raylo cartoon? Will that never see the light of day? I'm sorry, what? The Forces of Destiny Raylo cartoon. We'll never see that? Probably not. I mean, <sighs> it's over. I mean, I think that whole web series is done. So uh, you know it's it's locked in a room somewhere just sitting there. Let it free, Lucasfilm. Let it fly free. Free. It's time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, four but I just want to say... Said, oops, sorry, real quick. Four Leaf Clover said, <laughs> I'm sorry I was late. Sounds like it was wonderful. Will this be on your channel? Yes. Once we end this stream, it'll take maybe an hour or two for it to upload, um, but it will be on our channel. Yay. Just give it, a, give it an hour or two. <laughs> what were you going to say, Michelle? Oh, I was just going to say uh, about the rollout series. I've been kind of obsessed with it, honestly, since it started, because I just I'm very, very into metaphor and subtext and everything. So I've done a couple of breakdowns of a few of those episodes about what I think is the underlying metaphor going on in those stories and this new one with Ben Solo obviously is of no exception because I was all over it like a duck on a June bug the second that it dropped because I've been <laughs> like I said harassing poor Matt Martin about it for months um but I love them I just think they're they're so stinking cute like the kids are probably eating it up just because it's fun and adorable but I also think they're kind of layering some stuff in there that is more for our an adult take they sure are they sure are speaking of uh you are you host a podcast named uh unknown regions podcast and those deep analysis of the rollouts are on that podcast can you tell our lovely friends and family where they can find your podcast and listen to it yes thank you um we are 
on all the standard platforms, iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher. Um, those are probably the three that are most popular. But, um, yeah, it's me and my adult son. He's 20. Colin and I um, co-host the podcast. And um, we honestly just started doing it because I like to... I like to put it out there as a joke that it was my way of <clears throat> staying in contact with him when he went away to college that I would have, I would be able to be like, okay, we got to do an episode. You're going to have to talk to your mom for two hours now. Um, is that a joke or is that true? I will leave that up to everyone else to decide. <laughs> it, it really has been fun though. And now that he's home from college for who knows how long, um, it's been, it's a lot easier now because I can just grab him and be like, okay, let's go. So, yeah, I think we've done nine episodes now, so we're pretty new at this, but it's been so much fun. We love doing it. That's awesome. So awesome. And thank you guys for inviting me to do this, by the way. Again, thank you so much. You've been so super nice and reached out to me uh, you know over the past few weeks and I just really appreciate that it was so nice of you oh you're welcome we just we just loved having you on and love that you were able to to try this again with us and so glad we weren't yoinked this time <laughs> I know yay we did it mm-hmm. um, speaking of the children everyone really quick last night we did a Patreon live stream with Star Wars Santa and I think he's still in here Um, But Star Wars Santa is uh, uh, the operative word in that is Santa and he where he lives, he plays Santa for I mean, he practically lives his life (laughs) with the the Santa motto, but he uh, plays Santa for um, tons of children in the area. And last night in our stream, he said he would lend his services to um, anyone who had Skype. Yep. uh, Yes. If you have Skype um, and you have little children or little nieces and nephews or grandchildren, um, Star Wars Santa, if you can put your information in the live chat, and then once this uploads, if you can put it in the comment section too. Yes, if you would like to email him and set up a Skype chat, he Santa would be more than willing to, um, you know, in these rough times and kids are home, uh, speak to your kids and have them get a Skype call from Santa and just encourage them and help them out, um, you know, during this time. I think, and I love that idea, you know, uh, if my nieces and, or if my nephews and my niece were a little bit younger they would have eaten that up like to get a message from to get a skype call from santa oh my gosh so but i just thought that was a wonderful uh wonderful thing to do star wars santa to just uh you know reach out to all the kids that are stuck at home and i just loved it i loved it wonderful 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 and, and if you haven't, we have a new episode that just released yesterday. Unfortunately, iTunes didn't notify a lot of people. Not iTunes. Sorry, guys. I <laughs> feel f- uh, uh, sorry. It's been a long day and I've just been out of it since a fam- family member told me some things. So um, just uh, go and watch this podcast regarding dyads and the force. Mitra and Kreia from Knights of the Old Republic 2 are two of my favorite characters, especially Mitra. She is just fascinating to me, and she has the ability to basically create a force bond with everyone she meets. And this uh, this 
uh, video, this podcast really goes into the deep implications of what a force bond means and what does it mean to be connected in the force and, and gives us a little bit more information of what a dyad could mean. So please go watch that. Uh, we have 100% Star Wars as a guest on that stream. Okay. And he is just an amazing encyclopedia of uh, information from the EU. And and he's from England. And so you get to hear that English accent talk about Star Wars. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, seriously, why not go watch that? That is something I need to go watch immediately because <laughs> I don't. Like I was saying, I don't um, know much about the whole Force Bond Dyad stuff from from before Disney took over and started the sequel trilogy. So I definitely want to look into that for sure. And the yeah, it was a real fun series to do. Yeah, it was. It was. And and we did one on with him on uh, Revan and Basla, which are really the Raylo of the Knights of, of the Old Republic EU. So, yeah, he was just um, an amazing resource, and his channel is incredible too. So, guys, go and subscribe to One Hundred Percent Star Wars, and go and subscribe to Unknown Regions podcast. I've listened to Michelle, and she is a jewel and amazing and we love her so go support her too yes thank Thank you you. oh my gosh i do talk a lot though like colin sometimes has to it's hard for him to (laughs) he'll give me a dirty look across the table like can i talk please and i'm like oh yeah sorry i've only been rambling for 15 minutes straight (laughs) but thank you guys again so much this has been so much fun And I'm glad it finally worked. Yay. Yes. Yes. Yay. Thank you. Thank you you so much for joining us. And thank you for all your super chats and your comments and your questions and just being here in this wonderful community of ours. And, you know, we had uh, people in our comments with different views and perspectives. And it was just all, all respectful. Um, So thank you so much. Um, Michelle is not on YouTube Um, in the description of this live stream. Once it's re-uploaded, you'll be able to uh, see the links to her podcast. So, yep. You can find Girls with Sabres on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook. We also have Patreon. We are now, um, again, officially over 100 patrons, which is awesome. And, um, yeah, may the force be with you all. And peace, love, and Raylo. And wash your hands. (laughs) Social distance. (laughs) And stay safe, everyone. And we love you all. And we'll be live streaming again soon. 